So, you know, when I came up with this topic, this would be months ago, because they planned these things way in advance, you know, I wondered if anybody would even come. So this is exciting. This is exciting, right? And, and we have more coming. So I think we're probably going to still need some more chairs. So there's a little bit about me. The real key is that I'm not a scientist. So I'm not here to give you a conventional view of all this. However, I will give you an accurate view of this. So you're not going to get mumbo jumbo. But, uh, but a traditional scientist might have a different viewpoint. And we'll talk about that a little bit at the end because we confuse science with fact. Science is not fact. Science is just a really very supportable and sophisticated belief. And, and quantum physics kind of proved that point. Typical science, sci I have some laughing now in the audience. Typical science, scientists won't like that comment. Um, and, but I first got interested in this topic, luckily in college, where I was introduced to something called uh, philosophy of science. And this is where scientists engage in examining the assumptions of their own theories. Now, you rarely see this happen in the public press. You rarely see this happen in peer-reviewed journals. It's usually behind the scenes. But quantum physics has started to blow up some of these assumptions. Now, quantum physics has been around 100 years. And now, um, I'm also uh, interested in uh, neuroscience. I teach a class here called Neuroscience and the Law, um, which looks at the effects of our latest understanding of the mind and brain function on criminal action and punishment. And we won't get into that directly today, but one of the things that quantum physics forces us to think about is consciousness theory. If you know anything about consciousness theory, it's as loony as quantum physics is, okay? In fact, we have no theory of consciousness today. That should shock you, okay? No theory of how or why you have a self, why you wake up in the morning the same person you were when you fell asleep at night, why you have dreams, love, tastes, personality, etc. We have no clue how that happens and works. That's probably just as shocking to you as what you're going to get here in a minute. Maybe we should do one. Where's Ginny at? I don't see her. Maybe we should do one on consciousness theory next semester. Anyway, um, so this will be somewhat irreverent. And, and, I, and I say that because I'm forcing you to be confronted by these ideas. I want you to be curious. I want you to say, what the heck's going on? And actually go and read some of these books that I'll recommend to you when we're done, OK? All right, so quantum, I can barely see that. But quantum <laughs> physics deals with the subatomic world. So how many of you know something about quantum physics, right? OK, so most of you. You're not here blank slate. Now, this young lady up here, I'm going to guess you're nine? Eight. Oh, very good. <laughs> During the break, or before we started, she asked, what is quantum entanglement? Ooh, I hope some of you realize what an amazing question that is. You are awesome. So we're talking about the subatomic world, okay? That's the world that you and I can't see. Protons, electrons, now we know about quarks, now we know about things even smaller than that. I won't go there. Uh, we'll stay at the level of electrons and, and photons today. Now, classical physics deals with the macro world. That's the world you drove your car over here, you walked into this room. It's the three-dimensional world. It's the world of sight, experiment, observation, et cetera. That's the world that we typically associate with science, right? The classic seeing is believing. Use the scientific method. Observation gives us truth. Um, quantum physics, unfortunately, has blown all, those, blown all that up, set it on fire. And this all started over 100 years ago. And what's weird is quantum physics, the physics of, of the building blocks of this. So in other words, this um, lectern is made up of subatomic particles. Okay? We can't see them. We can't see the form. So the subatomic particles here obey certain laws that this lectern does not. How can that be? Does that make even any sense? <coughs> and that's what this whole hour will be about. They disagree. So the laws 
of this lectern, the fact that I can see it, touch it, hear it, and the laws of the things that make up this lectern disagree. And they disagree fundamentally. Here's the other problem with quantum physics. It's the most successful scientific theory in the history of science. Even though it has some of the wackiest things in the world. You heard from Ginny in the beginning. Subatomic particles can be in two places at once. Really? Who came up with that idea? Right? Pardon me? Somebody said something? Um, it took us a long time to prove that. Uh, entanglement. So all particles are connected regardless of the distance that they're separated by. Really? And they're connected faster than the speed of light, something that Einstein told us was impossible a few decades ago. So quantum physics is really successful. There is no conjecture that has been raised as part of quantum physics has ever been proven false. No other scientific theory can say that. Stephen Hawking, you remember him? He recently passed, had ALS, the brilliant physicist. I believe he was at Oxford. I might be wrong, might have been Cambridge. Um, one of his last books, he talked about the fact that quantum physics was the most successful theory ever in the history of science. And he proposed the theory of multidimensionality in order to solve the disagreement between classical physics, the lectern, and quantum physics, the things that make up the lectern, okay? So, uh, cell phones, computers, all sorts of things. We're gonna soon have quantum computers. Why are quantum computers gonna be so fast? Because particles can be in two places at once. So you can physically double the horsepower of your computer simply by using quantum principles. Don't ask me about that one. So it's successful. It's the basis of much of the technology used today. And yet it fundamentally disagrees with classical physics. It fundamentally disagrees with the way you see the world. That's what makes it so wild. All right, quanta. Uh, and I'm going to try to move through this fairly quickly. And by the way, questions are fine. You're not going to throw me off. I don't know this topic anyway. You'll see that here soon enough. Um, um, and, and, but I'm hoping to be done in time to have a little bit of time at the end for some questions because this is nuts, right? And so uh, it's the notion that reality is not made up of particles, but it's actually made up of energy. And so that's kind of the fundamental premise. So quantas, packets of energy. And recall Einstein, E equals mc squared. I know it's a little hard to see back in the back. Recall Einstein, E energy equals matter times the speed of light squared. So fundamentally, energy and matter are equivalent, according to Einstein. And so he's part of ushering in the quantum world, the quantum revolution. And yet, before his death, he hated it and he worked hard to prove it wrong. You've probably heard of the theory of everything. They're still working on that now. That would be a theory that takes the theory of the lectern and the theory of the things that make up the lectern and have a set of math that actually works for both. The math works individually, but not collectively. So the math of this being a three-dimensional object works but the math of the uh, particles that make up this lectern, uh, having quantum pro properties works, but obviously they can't work together because this lectern isn't in two places at once, right? It's just here. Weird. That's, what I, that's the main thing. So this should be the title of this, but if I said that, no one would come, right? <laughs> Things are not what they seem. That's what I want you to take away. Because when you leave here, unless you know a lot about this topic, you're not going to get a lot in an hour, okay? You can devote your life to studying this stuff and still not understand it even a little. Um, so the key is, is to be curious. Say, wow, what is this about? And the takeaway is things are not what they seem. Uh, here's a great quote from a scientist. This may come as a shock, but everything you think is wrong. I love that. 
I love that. Much of what you take for granted about day-to-day -day existence is largely a figment of your imagination. And you'll see why here in just a second. Ah, oh no. All right, did, did, did you got, do you two like that? That's a cool picture, isn't it? Thank you very much. Okay. All right, Niels Bohr, uh, kind of one of the leading lights of quantum physics, uh, uh, Nobel Prize winner in, co in quantum physics, and here's his wonderful quote. Everything we call real is made of things that cannot be regarded as real. Everything that's real can, is made up of things that we can't call real. Okay, and hopefully by the time we're done with that, that comment will make some more sense. All right, so here's the first crazy. I'm going to, I'm going to introduce to you, to you uh, several of these basic concepts of quantum physics. Uh, particle potentiality. So potentiality. This lectern is pretty hard. hurts my knuckles. It's made up of subatomic particles. But those particles have potentiality. In other words, it's called particle duality. They can either be fixed, as they are in this lectern at the moment, or they can be a wave. The very same particle that makes up hard matter can also be in a different context, unfixed, a wave. Probably can't see it back in the back, but down at the bottom it says, really? <laughs> There's no, by the way, this is not controversial. I'm, I'll tell you when I get to wacko stuff that I've come up with. <laughs> this, this is normal. This is, this is quantum physics 101. Whoops. Now, those of you who would like this slide, a set of slides, I'm happy to pass it on. This is a recording. I believe it's from the movie What the Bleep, if my memory's right, or maybe, yeah, I think so. Uh, you can find this on um, YouTube. And it's here in my slides. I'm not going to run it. We don't have time. Uh, but it's an animation of what I'm going to try to take you through right now. And so this crazy idea that, oh, now you have to answer a question. Whoever's phone just went off. Yeah, you're going to. No, oh, oh. <laughs> um, this, this double slit experiment is the first one that really established particle potentiality. Particle potentiality was postulated by these genius level cats you know, in the 20s and 30s, but of course there wasn't proof for it. And then along came this experiment. Very difficult to see, so I'm going to talk you through it here. Particles. Let's say we have a screen like this, and we have two slits in it. Then we have a screen behind it that records where the particles go when they're shot through those slots, okay? So normally, you shoot particles through two slots, and they're going to show up as two slots on the screen, right? Not controversial there. Now, if we t do electrons through one slot, you get exactly the same result. They go through one slot, they show up on the back screen in one line. But something weird happens when we add the second slot. So we send electrons to the dual slit, and we get five series of primary images. Probably can't see that. That color's not working good in here. So the point is, you blow it through two slots, and you get five significant images. Why? Because of the fact that the electrons chose, chose, by the way, electrons don't have a nervous system, they don't have a brain, they don't have eyes, okay? <laughs> but these electrons chose to then become a wave when confronted with the two slits. And, that, and, and waves have an interference pattern, and as they interfere with each other coming out from these two slits, we should have had these two spots here only, and we have five. Now this makes no sense. So first, we find out that electrons 
can have this dual nature. In some instances, they act like a particle. Some instances, they act like a wave. That's the first thing we discovered. The second thing we've discovered is apparently they think. So that little slide is asking the question, how or why did it choose to become a wave? So the math comes up to try to explain this. And the math says that they go through both slits, one slit, the other slit, none of the slits, all at the same time. In other words, an infinite number of possibilities. That's the math, right? Now, if that's the math and they've confirmed it, now we've got another principle that makes quantum physics nuts. And that's the concept of randomness. Subatomic particles act randomly. This lectern doesn't seem all that random, does it? And if I came in here tomorrow, would this lectern maybe have decided to be a wave? <laughs> Not likely, right? What's going on? So particle potentiality means that we now have this difficulty of measuring anything. And it leads us to the next general principle of quantum physics, the uncertainty principle. We cannot measure the location and speed or momentum of a particle at the same time. We can either fix its location, or we can either determine its speed or momentum, but we cannot do both at the same time accurately. The more certain we are of one, the less we are of the other. It creates an inverse relationship. So now the next weirdo thing we have is um, all of conventional science, all of you rely on the fact that you can see and hear and function and touch and live within this three-dimensional world we call reality, right? Please. What dictates the speed of the particle? Is it the speed of light or? No, just normal movement in the universe. Say if I turn on a light, that would be one measurement. If I was just measuring particles, uh, uh, just once we got elect electron microscopes and that sort of thing, we could go down to the subatomic world and look at these things. Once we started seeing them, we wanted to measure it, right? The normal thing that science does is measure. So atmospheric conditions change the speed of the particles? Are there atmospheric conditions in, in, in a subatomic uh, particle? Wind? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> no, I mean, the, these are principles that are true in all conditions. In other words, they, they've figured this out in the absence of extraneous factors. So something as simple as wind and that sort of thing would have been. So all particles travel at the same speed? No, 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 of course not. But what we, what, what, when they are moving, in other words, we live in a, right now, all we're bathed in subatomic particles. It makes up all the hard objects, it makes up our atmosphere, makes up all atoms are made of subatomic particles. Everything in the universe is made up of atoms, okay? And what we figured out is that when we attempt to measure them, or another way of, maybe this is a better way of saying it, when we attempt to see them, view them, we realize that we either can see them fixed, or we can measure their speed, we cannot do both. So then that brings, the, the, and again, that should be baffling, right? Please. Uh, <clears throat> does this principle apply to subatomic particles only? As we'll talk opposed, about that. As opposed to okay. baseballs being thrown. Right. Mm -hmm. Fabulous question. We'll talk about that in a minute because that's the tricky issue. If we have two realities, two sets of math, two sets of science, how do we bridge the gap? And we'll finish with that. Make sure that I... I answer that question when we come back. And so the bottom of this uh, slide says, uh, what's the, what are the implications for conventional science here? Conventional science is pre premised on accurate measurement. Let's go back to the double slit. So then they wanted to say, okay, so we've got these two slits, the electrons go through it, they do an interference pattern, and they have five patterns on the back, measurement screen, instead of just two. So now wouldn't it be interesting to see what slit they went through? 
Um, and so they added a camera and the electron then only went through as a particle. So you started watching, you wanted to measure, so you put a camera on one of the slots to see which one it went through, and then you only got two patterns on the back screen. Ooh, there's no wave pattern. So now subatomic particles act differently when they're being watched. But again, they don't have eyes. They don't have eyes in the back of their head because they don't have a head. <laughs> How do they know they're being observed? Well, we'll get to that. Believe me, I'm going to answer all of this, sort of. <laughs> that leads us to our next general theory around, uh, from quantum physics called the observer effect. Measurement or observation collapses the wave function and causes it to act as a particle. Matter, at least in the micro world, is directly affected by the observer. So is this lecture only takes shape because I look at it from the cultural lens? that tells me this is a lectern. I already know it. That's why I see it. Ooh, please. Your lectern could be changing to, from particles to wave, just not in the time frame we expect it. You come back in 500 years, and half of that may have <laughs> deteriorated into the energy we call waves. All right, so now you're even screwing this up more than I wanted to, right? <laughs> now you're making a bigger mess than I tried to. <laughs> But so you raise a really interesting point. I don't deal with it here because we could have a whole lecture on that and we don't have time because time doesn't exist. Einstein told us time is an illusion. Leave that one for another talk. So now we have the observer effect. So just chew on this for a minute. Subatomic particles which make up all objects in the universe, you, me, lecterns, act differently when watched. You got to love this. <laughs> come on, come on, you got to love this. Ooh, something bad just happened. <laughs> the black screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the, like the, the heart attack moment right. for the lecturer. <laughs> so the observer effect, um, whoops. It didn't go. There we go. So really? How about this? Theor quote from the theoretical physicist, so you don't have to hear this just from me. Quote, observations not only disturb what has to be measured, they produce it. We compel the electron to assume a definite position. We ourselves produce the results of the measurement. If you're on Facebook, or if you watch, uh, you know, different, uh, you can find woo-woo uh, art folks in this area and Sedona, and, and I love the woo-woo stuff, those of you who know me. Uh, this is why people with a straight face will say to you, you create your own reality. Sounds like nonsense, doesn't it? So, oh yeah, yeah, I've got um, uh, a mental illness or I've got a, 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 a sore back or whatever, and it's because I thought it, right? I can just think it away. And, and yet, at the level of quantum phys physics, there seems to be at least some theoretical truth to that comment. How about this one? This is my favorite. In the 20s and 30s, most of quantum physics was being thought. There was very little experiment that you could do to prove these things. The experimentations come much later and it continues to this day. Einstein, for instance, as I mentioned before his death, he tried to disprove all this crazy speculation. So one of the thought experiments from early on is that we decide what the photon or electron shall have done after it has already done it. In other words, thinking can not only alter the behavior of a particle now, pardon me, it can alter it, its activity in the past. Just recently it was confirmed experimentally, 
where they filmed some double slit stuff, but they didn't look at the film. They knew exactly what it was supposed to do because when it's not being watched, it does a wave pattern. So they sat down with the film before viewing it. The people, the, the uh, experimenters viewing it set the intention to have it act as a particle. And in fact, a three-month-old video was altered to do a two-slit pattern with no interference. In other words, they were able to alter a quantum experiment that occurred in the past. Probably shouldn't have put that slide in here. <laughs> All right, so reality RIP, right? Now, the, the, in, in other words, the conventional reality that you and I live in, that we came here with, that we take real seriously, right? Politics, religion, science, truth, right? That may all be just a mental construct. It may be all a very fascinating and elaborate and incredibly sophisticated dream. Now this leads us, this observer effect is the one that's really got people stirred up, right? Because you can imagine why. Subatomic particles are altered by whether someone looks at them or measures them. And that's either a human or camera. So they know when they're being watched by a human and a camera. And they, and they change. So this has led some folks to speculate on consciousness theory. In other words, if... if the observer effect is what brings subatomic particles into form, then maybe consciousness is a much bigger influence in the world than we ever imagined. And again, you can find lots of woo-woo stuff on consciousness. What's interesting is that the scientific world now on consciousness has gone woo-woo, and we'll get to that in a minute. And this has led to some very smart folks to speculate that we're actually part of an elaborate computer simulation or a video game. <laughs> Elon Musk, you can find this on YouTube. There's a one in billions, not billion, billion with an S, chance that we live in base reality. And he argues this because of the observer effect. And then uh, one of the top scientists at NASA, in quantum mechanics, particles do not have a definite state unless they're being observed. One explanation is that we're living within a simulation, seeing what we need to see when we need to see it. Other people, famous scientists, have argued this is a video game. I'll leave that one for you. You guys play video games? <laughs> Probably better than I am, right? <laughs> All right, you remember The Matrix, right? You remember? Don't you love that movie, right? So I tell people when I talk about quantum physics, I say, watch the movies because they actually got it right. These movies were not made by creative people. They were made by scientific people. Scientific people who've teamed up with people who know how to tell a nice story. So The Matrix... Um, a source code, Minority Report, what are some of the other ones? What's the one that DiCaprio was in? Inception. Uh, Inception. Go back and watch those. Gang, those are scientifically accurate movies. The Matrix is a scientific presentation of one of these crazy notions, at least one of the possibilities of quantum physics. Now, how about this one? Superposition. Again, this was postulated over a hundred years ago. We have now been able to prove it. Particles can be in multiple locations at the same time. Again, we haven't gotten any mind nutty stuff yet. This is all standard quantum physics 101. I haven't given you anything that you should reject yet. <laughs> <laughs> How can this be? This lectern sure seems to be in one place, doesn't it? And yet everything that makes it up. Everything that composes this lectern can be in two states at once. Some people have argued, and we'll look a little bit at this at the end, that there's actually an infinite number of such potential states. 
And why would anybody with a straight face like Hawking, you know, conventional science scientists with a reputation, why would anybody argue that that means that there's multiple worlds or parallel universes? Why do they argue that? Because it's the only way to save measurement in this dimension. I don't call that science, gang. That's as woo-woo as it gets. Please. So I'm an atheist, but what is the God particle? Whole nother topic. I don't know that I would be able to tell you what that is. It's a Not fundamental... Oh, well, well, no. I mean, it's a, it's a particle that, that exists. And it is fundamental to the existence of the other particles coming into existence. And it took them a long time to find it. It's called the Higgs boson. And, and so it's, it's, it, it's not quantum in the sense that it doesn't have anything to do with quantum laws. But it is a particle and, and, and it's a piece. Why do they call it the God particle? Because without it, particles would not have come into existence. Typical scientists won't call it the God particle, by the way. They don't like that. That's popular press. So different but, dark matter. No, not dark matter. <coughs> no, separate. And again, the only reason we talk about dark matter, you can't see it. The only reason we talk about it is the math needs it. So again, our, our understanding of reality is goofy. Even, even at the normal level, right? Quantum physics is not at the normal level. 2012 Nobel Prize in Physics. They came up with a really sophisticated series of mirrors and they tricked, let me put tricked in quotes, they tricked some atomic particles into not knowing they were being watched and lo and behold, they were in two places at once. 2012 Nobel Prize in Physics. <laughs> okay, <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> so when... Well, first of all, that's nuts to begin with, right? And so they confirmed another one of these crazy ideas of quantum physics, uh, you know, that a lot of people thought couldn't be confirmed. Well, it's now confirmed. They now came up with an elaborate enough scheme to trick the particle into not knowing it's being watched. And since when do particles think? <laughs> right? I mean, just, this should be striking you as absolutely crazy and yet absolutely proven. All right, so now it brings us to consciousness. If the observer effect is so important, if observation is what causes particles to act as they do, then we have to come up with some con con uh, conception of consciousness. Some people will want to call that God. Other people want to call that intelligent design. Other people will just call that very sophisticated actions of inert matter. Which one do you think makes more sense? Big hot topic right now. Here's Eugene Wigner, Nobel laureate. It's not possible to formulate the laws of quantum mechanics in a fully consistent way without reference to consciousness. The very study of the external world led to the conclusion that the content of consciousness is the ultimate reality. Not this lectern. Max Planck, founder of quantum theory, and, and Einstein took a lot of his work and extended it into the first theory of relativity. I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter, the lectern, as a derivative from consciousness. We cannot get behind consciousness. Everything we talk about, everything we regard as existing, postulates consciousness. Another word for consciousness, if you want some help with that, mind. Mind. If anybody is in here is part of New Thought Christianity, Unity Church, Church of Spiritual Living, that group, you know, a hundred more, you know, 1800s, they came up with the notion that God was actually mind. And they did this long before we had all this fancy ideas about consciousness and, and quantum physics, and that's at least proven quantum physics, etc. And so that's what they're getting after here. There's some underlying mental quality or consciousness or intention or something operating below this level of reality. 
After that, we have to argue. <laughs> Illusion. The doctrine that the world is made up of objects whose existence is independent of, hu of human consciousness turns out to be in conflict with quantum mechanics and with facts established by experiment. Quantum physicist. This is getting a little wild, but we all rely on perception so much, and yet quantum physics suggests that reality is altered by what we are looking at and what we are not looking at, or what someone else is looking at. And so you get this idea the, the, the number one expert in the world on perception, and I use him in my law classes um, because the num number one cause of an improper uh, eyewitness identification, in other words, the number one cause of a bad conviction, a false conviction, is an eyewitness that was wrong. So perception becomes huge in the legal area right now. And what we know is when you study people like Donald Huffman, I believe he's at Cal Irvine, is that there, there's no such thing as perception. That there are no pre-existing objects in space. That it's all created through a level of mind of some kind. Yours, someone else's, God, who knows what. And that creates a world that we function in but it's probably more of a mental construct than a reality. And what should happen right now if we had audio is you'd get ooh, -ee -ee, right? <laughs> right? Please. I understand the theory of it on a quantum level. And I understand the experiments that prove that observation turns the wave into a particle. What I don't understand is how that theory is reconciled with the physical universe that supposedly is 14 billion years old. And we can observe the physical <laughs> universe by looking, as, as you know, like, like what Hubble is doing, looking yeah. far, far into the past to see the light that's coming. So if human beings, this consciousness has only been here for, let's say, 300,000 years homo sapiens, 2 million years homo, period. What, how is that physical world in existence before we were here to observe it? Consciousness Two. isn't human. Consciousness may not be human, right? In other words, this is why you still have very strong scientific arguments for quote unquote God. And right now it goes by the name of intelligent design, okay? Brand new book out from the father of, of intelligent design. I just got it in the mail yesterday where he argues that um, uh, the latest DNA, uh, or excuse me, genetic information that we have uh, contradicts evolution. Um, and so, so we could get into a whole bunch of arguments here. Your question is perfect, right? You're thinking. You're trying to figure this out. And the honest answer is we don't have a clue. I will also say to you, and I'm on tape, there's precious little evidence for the Big Bang Theory. <gasps> I'm well, sorry. But, but I'm what sorry. about um, <laughs> archaeology or, or geology? That oh, yeah, the Earth's been around a long time, absolutely. Right. But, but the issue is uh, we have, what's the definition of human anyway? Homo sapiens is, is not, it's just the latest version, right? Um, we now know, we used to think Neanderthals were, you know, cavemen and dumb and all that. We now know they're very sophisticated. In fact, there's a significant portion of you in here that have Neanderthal blood in you. You know, we now know we intermarried with them. They were very sophisticated. We now know they did art, blah, 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 right? So we're always finding out these new things. The bottom line is, and this is where philosophy of science comes in, there is precious little evidence for the Big Bang Theory. Um, I know that sounds heretical, almost sounds stupid, doesn't it? It's the best theory that we have, however. We don't really have a decent other theory uh, other than a, a creation story. Scient scientific people want to be able to measure and observe and prove. So God gets excluded, okay? Uh, but if you're trying to find fact, um, that's a mistake. That, that's all I'll say here. I mean, 
I mean, the, the Big Bang Theory is actually created by a Catholic priest, a Jesuit. Um, but the, the Big Bang Theory is just the best thing we have, but there's precious little evidence for it, and it keeps changing on us. Please. What makes this all work for me is if we just consider that there's this huge ocean of energy, and these particles can go from matter to energy. You and I are part of it, uh, not only collectively in our brain, but in every cell in our body. And every bit of every particle can decide whether it's going in the direction it wants to go or not. And it can go through the slot and spread out, or it can go through the slot straight. And that is replicated more times than we can imagine. And that ocean of energy is what people try and define. And define. They're calling God because they haven't got a better word for it. That may be a perfectly good theory. I would never argue with what you just said, right? But look at the implications of that. You're talking about particles thinking. You're talking about particles acting independently of human beings, right? Matter, reality, lecterns aren't conscious, are they? Ooh, we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> Consciousness theory, there isn't any. And that should shock you. Please, sir. Why are you so obsessed with the lectern? <laughs> It's a, it's a prop, and I love this lectern, but it's a prop, right? It makes noise. I can hit it, but well, we all know what a lectern is, right? So when we talk subatomic particles, have you ever seen a subatomic particle? No, I haven't either, right? I mean, maybe in a picture, right? And so this is the only way that we can kind of talk about this stuff because it's not talkable about. <laughs> it's not a word. We have no idea how or why we have a subjective sense of self. Unbelievable. There's nothing in this entire college that we do that isn't premised on the notion that we are thinking human beings. And yet there is zero, zero evidence for that. If you are still of the mind that the brain creates consciousness, false not true um, and again we don't want I don't want to get you off on another topic because I could you know upset you enough with quantum physics but um, the, an un, the fact that we have an unconscious operating system is probably the best argument we have right now let me present this to you this is an fMRI some of you may have had experience with that I'm sorry if you have it's not fun but this will give you brain states uh, in real time. Someone can see the activity of your brain and we're talking activity here, metabolism, electrical activity, things like that. And so it's then put into color through uh, programming. And so this is my favorite study to present to people. I present this in all my legal classes. So they pushed people into this fMRI and they gave them a clicker in each hand. And you just lay there relaxed and whenever you so choose, you click right or you click left. Your choice. No rush, no pressure, you're calm. But a funny thing happened. By the way, they were trying to measure how long it took for you to think, move my right hand or click my right hand, and the time that it actually took for it to happen. In other words, trying to measure the time frame of the nervous system. I think, uh, click my right hand, and then it actually happens. Is that a tenth of a second, a millimeter of a second, blah, 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 not a millimeter, millisecond? <laughs> and so what they found out is that your brain had already decided which hand to choose seven to ten seconds before you did. Please. What if you got, forgot which one was left and which one was right? Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. That would be bad, wouldn't it? So maybe they had signs up in the fMRI, right? <laughs> but 7 to 10 seconds. Gang, this should blow your mind. So every decision that you make appears to have already been made by your brain. And we don't even know what that word means, right? Brain is a physical object. That's about all we know about it. This is weird. This should blow your mind. Now, they, they've replicated this. 
And so some critics said, oh, well, it's a reflex action, right? Your brain's just getting ready to move your hand or to click, click the thing. So then they did this same study on math. And so then in the fMRI machine, you chose how to do equation either through a subtraction or an addition process. You could reach the same answer either way. You choose, and there your brain decided four seconds before you did. So what the neuroscientists call this is a unconscious operating system. I have the link to that study there. Let's move on to entanglement. I threw that study in there just to give you a sense. Because when someone stands up in front of you and says, we have no idea what consciousness is or how the brain works, blah, right? It's a bunch of nonsense. But when we've tested it with our most sophisticated brain imaging systems and our most sophisticated computers, we have found that your brain decides before you do. Yikes. That begins to make this observer effect thing, this idea that some level of mind brings reality into existence, puts some flesh around it in our own personal context. Could it be just a measure of electrical impulses prior to the action being taken? Oh, we, we know electrical impulses don't take seven to ten seconds. Oh, okay, I get that. Yeah. In fact, they expected it to be, you know, almost immeasurable. They expected it to be so fast. Uh, that study is from 2004, and like I said, there's been a lot of research since that Predicting thought. <laughs> You're saying this is predicting thought. It's predicting what you are going to decide. It's not predicting thought. It's predicting a decision before you made it. Sir, in the back. If you respond to something like an equation or in athletics, which way the ball went, faster than four seconds or three seconds, did, did your brain decide before the problem was even presented? We have no idea. Great question. This, I mean, baseball or sports is a fabulous example of how nutty this is, right? Because baseball operates at the level of classical physics. I hear and see that ball. I then use my nervous system to react, make my muscles work. I choose the trajectory to go catch that ball, and then I actually catch it, suggesting that I really did it, right? But that's in classical physics. That's in this three-dimensional world. In quantum physics, that can't be replicated. That's why Einstein died trying to come up with a theory that brought these two wacky things together. And it's gotten so much wackier. He died, in, I believe, in 1955, the year of my birth, so I've often imagined that I'm his reincarnated. <laughs> no. Believe me, no. no. It's not working good at all. It's been very disappointing. <laughs> um, but he worked very hard to, you know, to bring the math and to bring these two conceptions together, and no one's done it. I'll get to the closest that anyone done, ha, ha, has done it here in a minute. Let's talk about entanglement. You asked about quantum entanglement. So let's take a particle. We've been talking about these crazy particles, right? Now let's divide it, and now let's separate it by the equivalent of miles. Five or six miles is usually what they've done in the experiments that I've, done mainly in, I've seen mainly in France. So we separate this particle. And then we stimulate one of them. The other one that's separated by five miles, which in the subatomic world would be a universe, instantly, zero lapse in time, instantly reacts. Faster than the speed of light. Einstein told us nothing could do that. And so these particles remain entangled is the word. Connected is not, could be another word, but entangled is the word the quantum folks use. And reacts at precisely the same moment in time. So this is another baffling uh, example. Now, they've even gone to the point where they've done this with separate particles. Instead of cutting one, they've taken two that have been near each other and separated them by miles, and they react exactly the same time. You may have heard this concept non-locality. That's where that concept comes. 
reality does not appear to be local. I'm going to be nuts on this lantern, black lectern again, <laughs> right? Um, this appears to be local. By local, we mean fixed in place in space. But reality, at the level of all the things that make up the lectern, isn't local at all. Ah, take a breath. Hope you can all see that picture. Back to the real world. Oops, there isn't a real world. We're back to Neil's. Everything we call real is made of things that cannot be regarded as real, i.e. particles that are in two places at once. Particles that do different things when looked at. <laughs> all right? That's what he means when he says, I mean, those things aren't real. I mean, we can't even measure their place and speed at the same time. Right? I mean, that's a classic um, observation, scientific observation, measuring the location and speed of an object. Cannot do it in the subatomic world. Dirty secret. In the 1920s, the quantum guys got together with the biology and the chemistry guys, and they said, the chemistry and biology guys said, dudes, <laughs> You're really screwing us up here. I mean, if, if you're going to blow up reality, we don't have anything to talk about. And so they made a deal, right? So we created these two different worlds. And so now you have people who specialize in quantum physics, and you have people who specialize in classical physics, and people who specialize in biology, and chemistry, and astrophysics, and they don't talk. Right? They're like my profession. Anybody? I'm a, I'm a lawyer. You go to a lawyer. And, you, and he's an expert in bankruptcy. And you say, oh, by the way, I need a will to you. I don't even think about that. I only do bankruptcy, right? Uh, uh, Dawkins, probably the most famous biologist that lives right now, uh, a, a radical evolutionary bio biologist, brilliant guy, best-selling books. When asked in an interview, how does quantum of physics affect his theories, he says, I have no idea. I don't know anything about quantum physics. You can see that on YouTube. You don't have to trust me. Gang, that's a problem, right? When we become so specialized, we, we can't even see another discipline right next to us, then it's become nuts. And that's where we're at right now. Because when we're talking quantum physics, we're not talking about a separate reality. You are made of quantum particles. This lectern, sorry. <laughs> this lectern is made of quantum particles. Here's this fa my favorite quote, and by the way, I have some books here at the end I recommend to you. One of them is called Quantum Enigma. It's by two profess professors from the University of California. They teach a class every year basically called, you know, quantum physics for dummies. They don't use the dummies word, but... <laughs> and so normal people like you and me can read this book. And here's their most beautiful quote. If quantum theory denies the physical reality of atoms, it would also seem to deny the physical reality of chairs, lecterns, which are made of atoms. Therein lies the rub, ladies and gentlemen. That's the problem with quantum physics. We're not talking about the atmosphere on the moon and the atmosphere on Earth. We're talking about reality right here, the reality that's below the visible, but right here and what I'm standing on, wearing, talking, Touching, please. There's no atmosphere on the moon. <laughs> oh, this is on tape and you caught me. <laughs> You're right, but what I'm saying is we're not looking at two different worlds. Is there atmosphere on the moon? Help me, somebody, fill me out. There's no atmosphere on the moon. There is no atmosphere on the room. I'm, I'm going to go with that. The moon doesn't have enough gravity to form an atmosphere. I'm not sure about that, but I'm going to go with you because I think you're smarter about this than I am. Here's what's interesting. And some of this has just been reported in the last month. And I believe, yes, I do have the site there. Um, experimenters are now increasingly able to see quantum effects with the naked eye. This is gigantic. Well, they're beginning to construct experiments and get some of these crazy quantum things like become fixed or become a wave, be in two places at once. And we're beginning to able to recreate it without magnification. Which means what? You can see it, 
which means now quantum's bleeding into the the reality world we claim to see, right? And ooh, ooh who's losing? <laughs> this world. Does this all really mean that Star Trek was scientifically accurate and we can teleport from one place to another? <laughs> Did you even doubt that then? <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty sure it was true, but it's nice to hear. There are people working on that right now, by the way. I think it's called travel at the speed of thought. Travel at the speed of thought, yeah. That, the CIA have programs with this, by the way. Yeah. When, uh, in the 1980s, when Ronald Reagan confronted Gorbachev and said, uh, you know, um, in a private meeting, he said, we know exactly where your illegal facility is. You've heard this story. And um, because it violated, I believe, his assault treaty. And Gorbachev, uh, the, the urban legend is Gorbachev came out of that and figured that we had penetrated uh, their security apparatus at the highest level and we knew everything. In fact, that was viewed by a psychic sitting at the University of California, was it Berkeley or Stanford? No, Stanford. Sitting in a room in Stanford who was able to bilocate his consciousness, see the facility, draw it, tell the CIA exactly where it was. Not making this up. Now that... It's called remote viewing. Now you can actually study it with the guys who ran the program. They make a lot of money. They run the stuff thing in Vegas quite often where you can go study seeing things at a distance, and I mean thousands of miles distance. But don't the SEALs already use quantum um, physics and saving um, the flow of the machines? Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I think they do. I think but they I, I wouldn't flow. doubt it, right? They call it flow. All right. I'm, I got to get move fast. Maybe I can push through this. Okay. Uh, I jumped over that other one because uh, I'm running a little bit out of time. Let's go back to the double slit. Now, this is just recently published data. It's another book I recommend highly. Horrible title. It's called Real Magic. It's really not about magic at all. This is a very prominent uh, uh, scientist, Dean Radden. And so they took meditators, experienced meditators, and said in the double slit experiment, Look at one of the split slits, focus on that slit, and think about the electrons only going through that slit. And what do you think happened? More went through that slit than should have, past, far past chance. In fact, it, if those of you who understand statistics, it went to the level of what's called five sigma, which is the same level of exceeding of chance where they, that they used to prove the Higgs boson that somebody just brought up a minute ago. So in other words, very, very solid data that sophisticated meditators could alter the behavior of subatomic particles. Whoa, that's almost too much. Whoops. Wait. Oh, did we lose? Okay. This is Einstein talking about time. Now this has led to all kinds of crazy theories. And these theories come from very sensible people. And the theory is designed to save science. It's to save three-dimensional reality. The reason why you come up with the idea there's an infinite number of Mike Davises standing in this room right now and an infinite number of parallel universes all making this speech but all saying something differently. That's the only way you can have the math come out and say that this is real. That's nuts. Please. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, theoretically, there would be uh, a, an alternate reality where I'm the one standing up there or being obsessed with electron and giving this uh, entire speech. Correct. Very good. And so you've probably heard of the molded verse, blah, blah, blah. The one that I love is multidimensionality. A Hawkins book, and I have it here at the end, talks about it. He argues there's 11 addition, or excuse me, a total 11 dimensions. We live in three, up, down, width, right? So you draw a cube, that's three-dimensional. He's arguing there's another eight sitting right next to us that we can't see. Here's a couple of books for you. Best book on consciousness, Origins of Consciousness by Nelson. The Quantum Enigma book I mentioned. I'm getting the ugly eye from the library staff. I need to be closing up. <laughs> Oh, no, you're not. I thought you were going to throw something at me. Um, a book that I just finished is called From Quantum Physics to Energy Healing, 
Now, this is real interesting. This is a gal who's a quantum physicist, a theoretical physicist, who got sick, sought out energy healing, got better, then started doing energy healing herself, and then in order to explain it, because it's wacko, any of you have experienced it, in order to explain it, she then began to apply her, the theories of quantum physics to it. Consciousness, blah, blah, blah. Very interesting book. Normal people can read it. You don't have to be quantum physicist. The Grand Design by Hawking and Milano, uh, that's the one that argues very, very convincingly that we live in a multidimensional universe. If we are in multidimensions, ladies and gentlemen, this is really a small part of reality. You are the Invert Use by Chopra and Kafatos. You probably all have heard of Deepak Chopra. Kafatos is a theoretical physicist from a university in California. I don't remember the one. That is the best book that takes the history of science, brings it to the present, and makes the most convincing argument, in my opinion, for the existing existence of mind being the animator of universe. Reality is not what it seems. That's a book for real scientists. That one's rough. And then Real Magic, I love, uh, but again, goofy title. What else do I have? That's me. That's my email. That's, that's my real phone number. That's not my office phone number. I don't answer my office phone number, but I do answer my cell phone, so that is me. But I'm happy to talk to anyone. I know this was fast, and if you're not going to throw me out, do we, do we have any quick questions at the end? Please. The book that turned me on to quantum physics was written, I think, in the 80s, maybe late 70s, The Dance of the Movie Masters. Are you familiar with that book? Yeah, yeah. But so much has happened since then. You know what I mean? Uh, Bell's theorem, the double slit experiments, those were all in the 80s and 90s. 2012, as we just saw, is proof of superposition, particles being in two places at once. Consciousness theory. I mean, oh, how, how we could have a whole fun time with consciousness theory, but the greatest minds in the world are arguing that consciousness is in everything. It's called panpsychism. So this lectern, <coughs> I know, it has consciousness, but because it does not have a developed uh, nervous system or ability to communicate, it's at a very rudimentary level. Rocks, according to this theory, have consciousness. You and I have a very high level of it, but it is central to reality. It is central, obviously, to the function of human beings. That's radical theory. That's coming from your genius level, peer-reviewed folks at reputable universities. This, I haven't given you too much woo-woo here. Most of what I've given you has been pretty rock solid. That's the problem I hope you're seeing, that if this is accurate, and experimentally, we, we think it's very solid what I've just explained to you today. This should have altered your understanding of what's going on. At least I hope it has. Uh, please, all the way in the back. Uh, the experiment with the meditators? Yes. Uh, were they imagining that they were seeing the electrons go through? Obviously? Right, right. So if they're imagining, you're, that's a kind of a creative part of your brain? Would that be in the Actually, they're not imagining they're seeing it. They're, they're focused on just one slot. Okay, so but they're... They're drawn to the one slot. But they must be obviously imagining electrons going through it, right? I would think so. I mean, I, I, I have not read the study in a while. It's been out about two years. My, my question is, uh, so if you imagine, or you creatively think about doing something, uh, if you could uh, collapse the field or intrude on someone else's, uh, if you get entangled with them. Oh, I see where you're going. Yes, absolutely. It, it, that experiment simply proving the crazy stuff we've just talked about. Yeah, that, that the, the, the particles, uh, the, the, uh, the particle potentiality is being chosen for the particle because of the observer, who, who in this case is a meditator. By the way, they use people who were not meditators, and they didn't alter the particles. <laughs> then they used people who were just okay meditators, and they altered it a little bit. So, so they did three different tests. Does that suggest that there's some sort of frequency they're on the versus <laughs> the non-meditators? It's a great uh, Well, I think what, what uh, Dean Radden argues in the he believes the explanation is 
that very few of us, unless we're highly trained, are able to focus on one thing longer than seven seconds. And so meditators were able to do, on average, 30 seconds or more, having no other thought but looking at that slit, whereas you, me, normal people, maybe three seconds is average. And so that's what he argued. Now again, who knows, right? But, but the author uh, uh, of the study made that. Please, ma'am. My question is, obviously all, all these experiments are done by people who can see. <laughs> I've never used anyone that was born blind. I'm uh, just saying that, you know, we all in the room go by visual, visceral type of things when we create or think. But I've always wondered what a blind person who's never seen, doesn't have color, only maybe sound or whatever. Right. Would, would, have they done anything with their brain? Not, not that I'm aware of in terms of doing an experiment like that. It would be fascinating. Because again, you get back to the brain, we're the one creating color. Yeah. But again, listen to what you're saying for a minute, right? You're suggesting, again, that this world that we function in is real, right? Because, because we're affecting it with our sight. Now, by the way, the, the closest that I'm aware of uh, is that the same thing happens whether it's a human observer or a measuring device or a camera. Whoa. Ah, anything else, please? Oops, I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Is it understood that all dimensions interact and overlap we don't know. Right now, multidimensionality is a mathematical construct. We haven't measured it. So in your example of the lectern, it's physical and yet it isn't. Is the part that's just particle maybe an overlapping dimension and the lectern that we see is only in, in the dimension? See that. See, that's good. See, <laughs> see that's good. You're thinking. But the problem is, I, I have no answer for you, and I don't know that anyone does, right? That's what makes this all so baffling. I think it was you next. Do you think that anybody or anything is actually thinking for the particle? That would be bad, wouldn't it? So the question was, is someone else thinking for the particle? That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Well, I mean, scary is what I meant. Because obviously humans a lousy job. Very true. We, we probably should close it up, but uh, oh, one more. What is your favorite theory or theories of consciousness? Oh, I like panpsychism, and I liked panpsychism before it got popular. Uh, but that more my belief systems, right? And that's the problem with science. There's no such thing as a scientist without underlying philosophies, beliefs, beliefs in God or not, etc shade our conclusion. I went to panpsychism because my own background in faith. Now the science has come to panpsychism. You've got, uh, I mean, uh, Christoph Koch from the brain, or from the Allen Brain Institute in Seattle, probably the leading theorist in this area. He's now a panpsychist. Uh, two decades ago he wrote a book with Francis Crick where they argued that there's no such thing as consciousness that you were just a function of high-level neuronal and hormonal activity uh, in the brain. Um, and so in two decades, he's gone from co-authoring the number one book on materialism, uh, and now he's probably one of the most famous uh, proponents of panpsychism, which is the argument that consciousness is everywhere and everything. Nothing worse than a convert. Nothing worse than a convert. Thank you, everybody, so much.